Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here at this, uh, this event uh, with the Wilson Center, an event on seabed mining and the critical minerals dilemma for the United States. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives here at the Wilson Center. For the past year or so, a number of colleagues and I, working alongside a wide range of stakeholders in the sector, have been working not only to understand the critical mineral supply chain itself and its weaknesses, but also to put forward concrete policy ideas that can positively influence both legislation and the industry ecosystem. Over the last year, um, the Wilson Center has also published an important report titled The Mosaic Approach, in which we analyze the vulnerabilities in the critical mineral supply chain, identify the need for urgent action by industry and by government, both executive and legislative branches, and called for a multi-dimensional approach to strengthening the supply chain. Also in that report, we called on policymakers to examine new sources of critical minerals, including the potential for harvesting polymetallic nodules from the seabed. Today, I'm delighted to be able to introduce and moderate what promises to be a stimulating conversation with some true experts in the field on the potential for seabed mining, the need for US engagement in the global regime governing activities on the seabed, and of course, the national security implications of inaction. I'm grateful to my colleagues in the Environmental Change and Security Program for their co-sponsorship of this event. And of course, to all of my wonderful colleagues in our AV department for making this possible. Special shout out, especially to Mary D'Amico and Alexander Helfcott, who have worked so hard to pull this event together and who have to suffer through many work days with me. Before I open the floor to re opening remarks, let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Greg O'Brien, who is a senior oceans policy advisor in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs at the US Department of State, focusing on maritime security, freedom of navigation, deep seabed mining and marine pollution, as well as other policy areas in the law of the sea, including in the South China Sea and Arctic. He has led and participated in delegations to the UN, the International Seabed Authority, International Maritime Organization, the Contact Group on Piracy off the coast of Somalia, and other multilateral and bilateral meetings. Second, delighted to introduce Commander Kirk Lippold, formerly of the US Navy, currently adjunct professor in the United States Naval Academy and president of Lippold Strategies. Third, I'd like to introduce Professor Salim Ali, PhD, Chair of the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences and Blue and Gold Distinguished Professor of Energy in the, in the Environment, sorry, Energy and the Environment at the University of Delaware. Last, but by no means least, we are honored to have with, with us one of the most respected voices in US energy policy, Michelle Foss. She's fellow in energy minerals and materials at the Baker Institute at Rice University. She has nearly 40 years experience in senior positions in energy and environmental research, consulting and investment banking, and leads the development of the Center for Energy Studies, Energy Minerals and Materials Project. I urge you all to take a look at the extraordinary resources that are available on the Baker Institute website in this area. Thanks again to our audience for joining us. What is a timely conversation? As we were discussing very briefly before we, uh, we launched the, uh, the live feed, uh, the conversation over seabed mining has become highly polarized. We're seeing um, very passionate uh, opinions being put forward on, on all sides here. Uh, as is usual for the Wilson Center, we're hoping to base our conversation today, not just in the facts, but in reasoned analysis, uh, obviously nonpartisan, as is our way here at the Wilson Center. And we're looking forward to actually engaging with the audience as well. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give some brief opening remarks between three and five minutes. Then we'll ch turn to Q&A and discussion. If you would like to send a question to our panelists, then please uh, send us a tweet uh, through our Twitter feed at Wilson Center. First of all, now I'm going to open up the, uh, the floor for, uh, uh, for Greg O'Brien. Greg, over to you to lead us off on this conversation. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, thank you to you and the uh, Wilson Center and uh, your staff for organizing this event. As you say, it's a very uh, timely event and uh, looking forward to participating. Um, I'd like to address uh, initially the importance of seabed uh, minerals uh, to United States national security. Uh, certainly, um, seabed minerals have the potential to help meet or address our climate security, energy security, and critical mineral supply security needs in the face of increasingly vulnerable uh, uh, mineral supplies. 
Um, as you suggested, most of the focus internationally is on the polymetallic nodules that reside in the clarion Clipperton zone. Uh, that's a, a, a plain area uh, southeast of Hawaii and west of Mexico. Uh, that's about the width of the continental United States uh, and about half its depth. Um, the polymetallic nodules uh, just in uh, the CCZ area uh, contain more than three times the amount of cobalt known to exist in all terrestrial deposits and similar levels of nickel and manganese uh, along with uh, rare earth elements. So certainly this is a potential resource uh, to assist in helping to meet um, uh, imminent uh, critical, critical mineral supply needs. Um, the United States uh, uh, participates in the development of uh, the international regulatory framework uh, to uh, access uh, these mineral resources. The Law of the Sea Convention established the International Seabed Authority uh, to regulate uh, seabed mining in areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. We are not a party to the convention, uh, but we attend and participate in meetings of the Seabed Authority as an observer delegation. Uh, there are obvious disadvantages of being an observer as opposed to a member of the authority. We're not able to sponsor US companies uh, for Seabed Authority exploration contracts. We're not able to participate in voting or other decision-making, uh, but we do contribute uh, both directly and through our partners uh, to the work of the authority. Our objective overall uh, is uh, one that's been uh, consistent over the decades for the United States. Uh, we uh, are pursuing in a stable internationally recognized framework for seabed mining that ensures effective protection for the marine environment. And it's that last aspect as you alluded to in your uh, introduction, uh, that uh, is uh, a very, very hot topic of a uh, range of views at this point. Uh, from our perspective, we want to get it right. Uh, if we exploit these resources, we do want to do it only in a way that ensures effective protection for the marine environment. So that's it. Uh, back to you, Duncan, and thank you again very much for uh, organizing this event. Terrific uh, start for us, Greg. Um, thanks for setting this up. Uh, Kirk, to you. Well, first, Duncan, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel today. I think it is both timely and topical. I think that everyone today realizes, and especially with this panel, that climate change is a reality and it's how we are going to address it is going to have a direct impact on our national security, not just now, but well into the future. I think that everyone realizes that the United States and nations around the world are making a concerted effort in the electrification, not only with vehicles, but throughout the energy resource dependence that every society has today. When you look at that, you have to look at how we get a hold of these resources. What is it going to require for us to be able to get the electric vehicles, to be able to reduce some of the polluting emissions that we have today, to try and make some impact that, the, that humans have on our climate throughout the world. When you look at the minerals that are available today, everyone has lofty goals on the electrification. But when you look at what is actually available, either through current mining or identical mining resources that we have throughout the world, we can't get there from here. We have to look at and develop other resources that are available to us. The United States being an island nation, it's very important for us to look just beyond our borders, but to work in concert with other nations because energy independence and energy reliance is going to be a national security issue no matter what we do. When you look at the countries right now that are working together, you have to consider the fact that right now, the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine is having an adverse effect on one of the critical minerals for battery supplies, and that's nickel. Russia is the principal supplier of battery grade nickel throughout the world. When you look at what China is doing in the South China Sea in contravention of international law, 
going beyond just the first island chain in Tuan, but out to the second island chain with the islands that they have seized and militarized against international law. And when you look as far as the third island chain, where they and some of their strategic thought are going all the way out to Hawaii, it's very important for the United States to engage in large areas of the ocean to ensure that we have free transit and free ability for economies around the world to be able to operate. As Greg mentioned, that clarion Clipperton zone that is south of Hawaii and due west of Mexico, that area contains some of those strategic minerals. And why we'll be, we will be conscious of the environmental impact we may have as we try and gain those uh, polymetallic nodules and use the resources that each of them contain. We wanna do so in a responsible manner, but at the end of the day, we wanna have national security. We want to have that energy independence that we need. We want to work with some of the international authorities that are doing that, even if it's in an observer status, because the United States has not ratified the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, which subsequently feeds into the International Seabed Authority. So how the United States engages in this area and what we do to gain those resources necessary to ensure that not only we, but our allies throughout the world can do it in a responsible manner that respects international law, that in fact contributes to a rule-based world order where some countries choose not to do that, is going to be critical to our future, critical to our national security. And I think today, when you look at the seabed minerals and what can be gained by harvesting them and using them, is going to be critical to our future to keep us a secure and free nation and a free world. Commander Lippold, thank you so much for an eloquent uh, uh, approach to uh, to this question from the national security perspective. I absolutely agree with, uh, with what you just said there. Um, I'll be delighted now to pass the microphone over to Salim Ali, and let me just give a little uh, plug for a new publication from Salim. Uh, a book uh, titled Earthly Order, How Natural Laws Define Human Life um, that uh, is recently, uh, sorry, will be coming out in a few weeks' time uh, through Oxford University Press. Congratulations on that uh, publication, Salim. Um, I know how, uh, how difficult it is often to get a book finished. People say it's like having a child. I have no, um, nothing to compare that with in terms of giving birth, but I know that it was one of the most painful things that I ever did was actually getting my, my book to, uh, to the publisher in the end. So congratulations on that and over to you. Thank you so much, Duncan. Um, well, um, the topic at hand is one that um, resonates with the, the, the title of the book because it's kind of uh, an issue of looking at a system's perspective on meeting human needs. Um, and uh, basically, when we're talking about um, minerals and energy delivery, we're dealing with some fundamental physics, right? We're dealing with the material energy nexus. Uh, we're dealing with thermodynamics of what is possible. And often I start off with my students, I say, you know, there's no free lunch in the universe. And quite literally, that's the kind of conundrum we're dealing with, with reference to uh, mineral sourcing and energy delivery. And the debate has become very polarized because we have this sense that we can always get win-win opportunities for uh, meeting the needs of modern civilization. And uh, so I have approached this topic very much as a system scientist. And the only way to consider deep sea mining in terms of its environmental governance is to also look at land-based mining. And so much of my research in the last years has been focused on comparing the environmental and social impact of deep sea mining with terrestrial mining and then figuring out like where where is there a sweet spot for some minerals perhaps which should be sourced from uh, deep sea compared to on land and one of the key areas why this becomes plausible is because unlike terrestrial mining we do have a, a governance mechanism for deep sea mining at an international level. Uh, all of the governance mechanisms for terrestrial mining are at the national level. And uh, even though the International Seabed Authority has its imperfections as do all international institutions, the fact that it existed for 20 odd years and has been working towards some kind of environmental regulatory mechanism shows us that there is this 
convergence between natural order and social and political order, which is one of the goals of um, my, my recent research. So uh, that's how I'm approaching it. And I'm hoping that our conversation can be based on that kind of a science-based analytical comparison uh, between these different forms of extraction. Thank you, Salim. Um, and, and, and just to sort of respond to what you just said, one of the ways in which we've approached this issue has been to engage with a wide range of stakeholders over the past year or so, from industry, from civil society, from government, and trying to base this as much as we can, yes, on the science, um, and also uh, as uh, in a way which is inclusive, um, because you know, my experience uh, has been over the years that if you leave uh, key stakeholders out of the conversation, then of course it ends up uh, backfiring on you. Something actually that Michelle taught me many years ago, which was the, uh, the need for sort of smart investment strategies where you actually engage, you front load the, uh, the process of decision-making by making sure you have as much information as possible. And with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over to, uh, to Michelle. Actually, Michelle, if you don't mind, uh, let me just remind our audience to please send uh, questions through our Twitter feed. I think I may have misstated our Twitter feed earlier on. It's at the Wilson Center, not just at Wilson Center, at the Wilson Center. So please send your questions in now. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Well, thanks, Duncan. Nice to see you again um, and to join your program. And the task that I have is to provide for everyone a context for why we're having the conversation today when it comes to our conventional uh, mining and minerals businesses. And I will start off by saying that I don't need anything else out there in the form of energy transitions or um, environmental responses, uh, climate, emissions, whatever anyone wants to, to put on the table to worry about mineral supply. Um, we're already there. You can see it in the markets, in the commodities markets, um, and the pressures that have been building um, for some time. Um, I also want to kind of lay out an argument that we can come back to later that I think it's a mistake to link for this discussion, the extraction of minerals from seabed resources with specific things like the desire for electric vehicles and electrification. It is a frontier resource that we have to look at no matter what. And, and that's my contention um, for us to, to consider today. Um, when it comes to the first point, um, the status of mining, I'm, I'm gonna be bold and say that we're entering a period of peak minerals. So you all remember peak oil was a popular phrase. We're going to have to get used to peak minerals and the same reasons are there. Um, this, it's a tough business. Um, the extractive industries are upstream of everything that is downstream um, when it comes to minerals use. Um, it's hard to uh, realize investment. Um, there have been a pronounced lack of discoveries for years, years, for all of the major metals and minerals that we rely on. A lot of this goes to problems in investment regimes in, in a lot of countries, including ours. Um, um, so we're, we're, none of us are, are free of the, of the challenges of how to facilitate and foster investment in, in all of the extractive businesses that we need. Um, we have the realities of old mature properties, um, remote locations, um, declining head grades at existing uh, mining operations, low ore grades at uh, locations of new op opportunities, and even um, in expansions of existing um, uh, operations themselves. Uh, quality is an enormous issue. Not all minerals are the same, so we have to clarify that. And this, this is a point that we have to come back to for uh, the marine-based resources as well, because in some respects, they are higher quality, which means better facilitation of beneficiation, processing, refining, the, the efficiency of extracting all of the critical elements that we need. Um, access, 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 of course, is always one of the first things that comes up when you talk to people in the mining industry, um, in the oil and gas industries, any of the natural resource businesses. Um, the need for high uh, quality targets is there. 
Um, we have problems with inconsistent policy making, <laughs> inconsistent regulatory oversight, um, ill-defined goals on ESG, which are slopping over to the marine mineral side. And then we have the demographics of, of mining and minerals processing that are a problem. Um, Commander Lippold mentioned China. Um, we have to acknowledge China's role in the existing businesses, their dominance across all of the supply chains, which will extend to maritime territoriality. Um, my second point I, I wanted to put on the table, this is from our own um, roundtable on, on marine minerals that we had last summer in June, that um, we've got a, a, we have a report and a brief that we'll be issuing soon from that. Um, we're talking about the UN area today, but there are opportunities outside of the UN area that may come into the market first. And we just need to acknowledge that um, there are accommodating governments um, in the Pacific um, and, and there are operators uh, that are pursuing those opportunities. Um, we have an offshore industries base that is on the oil and gas side of the business that we've been looking at closely and it's vital and really important for everything from um, global positioning, navigation, um, extract, extraction, logistics, you name it. A lot of, of the technology for the first wave of, of investment and, and for marine minerals operations will come from that. And, and so a better understanding all of that um, is I think uh, an important thing. And it gives the US a bit of an edge actually um, to think about. And, and there are out there alternative approach, approaches to managing environmental risk. I'm assuming Celine has looked at some of those, but uh, some of the concerns that people have about seabed extraction, um, there are good alternatives for um, managing those. And then finally, just some considerations in all of this. We don't operate in a world where, you know, we have a singular focus when it comes to minerals use. We have defense, we have non-defense needs, we have energy, we have non-energy needs. We're helping with NATO right now on a critical uh, minerals assessment for weapons systems. Um, I think that all of those concerns are going to probably segue to the front of the pecking order, and we will have to um, maybe pull back on some of our energy ambitions in order to accommodate other things. Um, and then finally, with, with regard to concerns about moratoria and other things, I think um, an important message here is that whenever we talk about that stuff, what we're also talking about is locking out new ideas, new technologies, new advances. And so you can prevent the whole thing by preventing it, but then what you're also doing is preventing the advancement of the state of knowledge, the state of technology that humans are gonna need going forward. And so that's a pretty big trade-off, I think. Um, to consider as we debate all of this. Back to you, Duncan. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to all of our uh, panelists for their excellent opening comments. Michelle, I'd like to do a follow-up question with you immediately, if I may, which is um, you know, on the, uh, the demand for critical minerals. I know that you guys at, uh, at the Baker Institute have been doing a lot of work on this. Um, I know you put out a, a nickel case study recently um, uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, rising demand for critical minerals, um, you know, from, for clean energy and beyond, um, and also, you know, growing, uh, and existing, existing and growing industrial uses for critical minerals. Well, I think, first of all, it's important for people to understand that the rate of growth in supply of non-fuel minerals products, which reflects what we consume across all of our, our applications, um, industrial and, and consumer, um, has been growing faster than petroleum, than natural gas, um, so faster than the fuel minerals, um, almost as fast as electric power. Um, so that just gives you an idea of, you know, appetite um, it's these wonderful things um, that we love, our smartphones, our electronics, our modern appliances, our, our dwellings, our vehicles, our clothing, our everything, um, you know, is, is what's moving this forward. And, and, um, and so we've got a growth rate out there, what I call baseload demand, that reflects all of the existing uses um, that we have. 
when it comes to demand going forward, numbers are all over the board. And I, I, I it's, it's, um, I, I, I want to quote a mutual friend, um, uh, Mike Mayton, who was um, on, on the, has done things for both of our organizations, um, who pointed out that when it comes to battery metals for electric vehicles, the forecasts are roughly five or six X difference. I mean, it, it, it all depends on battery chemistries, um, uh, applications going forward, new technologies and, and all of that. But as I said, I can take all of the alternative energy technology stuff out of the picture and still have a robust growth rate for non-fuel minerals demand that reflects changing materials, changing uses, advances in electronics, um, advances in, in, um, in, in semiconductors, um, everything else that is that underlies the, the gamut of things from healthcare to consumer products to defense, um, you name it. And so my concern is that we, you know, we have to honor those commitments. And then we, on top of that, have to think about, you know, what makes the most sense in terms of scaling up other energy technologies and, and, and other devices. Thank you, Michelle, for that reminder. Um, in, a, in a recent testimony up on Capitol Hill, a representative of the defense industry noted that uh, the company that he represents has already had to uh, substitute out certain critical minerals um, in their uh, technology. Um, because of shortage of supply, um, which meant that those weapons were not nearly as effective or accurate as they had first uh, you know, designed them to be. And so we do go straight or, or rather rapidly to the national security calculation. Um, uh, of course, you see a similar thing with the current uh, problems with the semiconductor supply chain as well. Um, I'd like to go back right now though to, to Greg and then to, to Kirk, if I may. Um, and, and Celine, please feel free to jump in here as well, which is where are we in terms of our relationship? And by our, I mean the United States government you know, with the ISA. Greg, you spoke earlier on about how the fact that, uh, you know, although not a member, the United States maintains a relationship with the ISA um, uh, and follows a lot of the uh, um, or follows the law um, from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, but in fact, at this point in time, he's not getting many of the benefits from that. Um, I hope I'm not misstating that, but I wonder if you could sort of delve a little bit uh, deeper into that relationship and the development of the global regime on seabed mining. Sure, happy to uh, start that off, Duncan. Uh, so uh, again, just for our delegation and our um, national interests at the Seabed Authority, uh, we've been uh, uh, participating in the authority's uh, efforts uh, from the inception. Uh, we initially uh, were uh, a charter member of the, uh, of the authority uh, when it became evident that we would not become party to the convention. Uh, then we uh, uh, transferred to observer status. Uh, again, it's, it's a challenge uh, uh, participating as an observer, not insurmountable. Uh, and uh, there are a number of like-minded uh, partners uh, who are members of the authority with whom we engage multilaterally, bilaterally uh, to uh, pursue uh, our objectives. Um, as far as the um, sustenance or sustainment of uh, the authority, of course, it's built on the idea that it would initially proceed based on uh, member state contributions uh, and then transition over time uh, to a sustaining body uh, based on uh, uh, a royalty scheme uh, that would be a condition of contracts for exploitation. That part of it still remains a bit of a variable. Uh, talks are underway to um, agree on uh, a formula for the royalty calculation. Uh, and um, when that would enable the authority to transition to a self-sustaining uh, entity uh, remains a, a obviously down the road and a bit murky. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, Celine, would you like to add anything there in terms of uh, what you see in the development of the uh, the regulatory regime? 
Well, I think uh, there is a process underway which is fairly detailed and uh, the, you were talking about civil society involvement. It's a fairly inclusive process overall. Uh, the civil society groups are invited to the meetings uh, at the ISA. Uh, uh, the main uh, sort of bone of contention is the way in which the legal and technical commission of the ISA uh, is uh, selected. And the, the NGOs criticize that aspect of the ISA in terms of the regulatory regime. And, you know, there should be some room for constructive criticism. But unfortunately, what some of our friends in the activist community have done is sort of throw the baby out of the bathwater. And uh, they have amplified the calls for a moratorium to the point where it is impossible to even start some process of negotiation on reforming those regulatory regimes. So I think that's where we need to have much more constructive dialogue in terms of the environmental governance, the way in which the rules are going to be formulated. What do you want done constructively to make it better rather than just to keep on harping on the same issue with reference to the moratorium? And Kirk, if I can come to you, um, you know, that the, the specter of a moratorium, um, the fact that the United States is... Uh, you know, not a full member of ISA, uh, and, and you brought up the uh, the issue of China earlier on and national security. Um, you know, the Chinese are going to go ahead anyway. Other nations are going to go ahead anyway. I imagine in the in the absence of uh, of U.S. participation, can you talk a little bit about that? About what does this mean for the United States? Well, I, I think what you're going to see, Duncan, is that the United States, while not having ratified the UN Convention on Law of the Sea and participating directly with the ISA, is there is going to be somewhat of a negative pack, uh, impact on our national security. That said, we want to work with our allies and those that can participate in the ISA and do it in a manner where we do create that regulatory environment that does have the framework for countries to be able to not only take advantage of this resource for mankind, as it's put, and be able to extract those minerals to be able to use them. The reality is right now is that where the world wants to go with electrification and with other uses of these minerals across the board that Michelle mentioned, we can't get there from here with what is available today. So we have to look at other things. When you look at the moratorium that wants to be put in place, while that may sound convenient, that has a negative impact for national security across the board. That moratorium is the same kind of outlook that they have where you have the keep it in the ground movement, and that's not realistic either. We are still very dependent across the board along with other nations with fossil fuels, but there's the growing recognition that these minerals are going to enable us to enhance national security positively impact the climate impact that we're having across the across the globe and be able to maintain that freedom of navigation in the seas. When you look at what China is going to do, they are going to be ruthlessly focused on what is going to achieve what they perceive to be their national security objectives, first regionally and then globally. When you look at what is being set up in what's called the Quad, which is the United States, Japan, India, and Australia, working together to ensure that there is somewhat of a counterbalance and that they want to participate in what can be done using the Clarion Clipperton zone to get some of these minerals, as well as some of the land-based resources that are available, especially in Australia, that is going to continue to enhance that national security outlook where this is involved. But the regulatory scheme has to be put into place so that you have a framework for developing those resources. A moratorium sounds good is, while, while people want to put a moratorium into place, the negative impacts of doing that are too far reaching with too many second and third order effects that have ne negative consequences across the world. And so consequently, we can't do that. So I think at the end of the day, you have to take that more reality-based approach of what do we have today where do we need to go with extracting these minerals around the world? Look at what the Clarion Clipperton zone can provide and how we can do it with minimal environmental impact. And what at the end of the day is going to be the national security implications, not only for the United States, but others as well, because we're not the only nation affected by it. Each of these other nations that are democratic in nature 
understand the importance of developing the resources responsibly to ensure that we can continue to have some of the systems develop, not just weapon systems, electrification and others, but how those minerals integrate throughout the economies of these countries. One other quick point, Duncan, uh, to build on that, you know, with the moratorium, there is one example in the past where there were calls for a moratorium uh, within an existing uh, UN convention, and that is the Convention on Biological Diversity. And some years ago, there was a call to have a moratorium on gene drive technologies because activist groups felt that this was too risky technology. We didn't know the impact. Um, but the benefits of gene drive were obvious. For example, uh, you could um, have uh, certain kinds of uh, pathogens uh, eradicated if you had the right kind of gene editing done. Uh, and uh, so there was a vote and actually the vote came out um, not to have a moratorium. Uh, and the, the case was made that the science had been argued through and that the benefits outweighed the costs. And I think the similar process is uh, playing itself out here. And uh, the systems approach will require us to look at the social and environmental impact of land-based mining. The big advantage that deep sea mining has over land-based uh, resources is you do not have social disruption in the same way. You do not have indigenous communities and sacred sites which are going to be disrupted. You don't have property rights regime where people are going to be relocated and having to deal with all of those externalities which are very severe. Uh, you don't have tailings dams failures potential which you have from many land-based resources. So you have to kind of balance all that out and that's why the opportunity even from an environmental perspective uh, needs to be made. The main issue is the biodiversity impacts in certain ecosystems are unknown, and that is a concern. But that, there can be very good monitoring mechanisms put forth to ensure that that is done in an incremental way so as not to have irreparable harm. Thank you, Selim uh, and Kirk. I, uh, I'd like to remind our audience, please send your questions uh, through our Twitter feed at the Wilson Center. Um, I have my first question, which actually came in through my email just now. And uh, I'm going to put this one to Greg, but anybody else, please feel free to chime in. Uh, it's from Matthew Cranston, who says, simple question. Why is the United States not a signatory in the International Seabed Authority? Uh, Greg, uh, I know that you have some, you know, some idea, obviously, about the history of this and where we stand today in terms of the political um, balance here in the United States. Um, I can see from Kirk's face that uh, he's got some thoughts on it as well. But please, Greg, lead us off on that. Sure, thanks. Uh, so, Matt, thanks for that simple question. The simple answer is we've not uh, gotten uh, sufficient numbers of senators to provide its advice and consent to uh, the United States joining the convention. Uh, the reasons for that are complex. Um, but... Um, this administration, uh, like past, uh, many past administrations on both sides of the aisle, Republican or Democrat, uh, supports the United States joining the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, among other things, it would uh, enable the United States to fully protect its uh, uh, navigation rights and freedoms, its economic rights, access to critical minerals, and other rela uh, ocean-related interests. Uh, so. Um, as, as, as I uh, suggested, there, there's a, a, a complex set of reasons why uh, the uh, political outcome of achieving uh, the sufficient numbers of uh, senators in support uh, hasn't been attained. Uh, but if that number uh, were attainable, uh, certainly uh, we would be pursuing our interests as a party. Thanks, Greg. I, uh, I'm going to turn to, to Kirk right now for some ideas about what we might do uh, to move the conversation forward beyond this event. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, anecdotally, when I first got into the, uh, um, the area of energy policy, I was living in Mexico and Mexico was facing a, an energy crisis at the time. It was obvious to anybody who studied the issue that Mexico needed to open up to foreign and private investment in the energy sector. And I remember in 2005, I naively asked, why don't we just tell the legislators what the situation is? And of course, the older and wiser heads around me said, we've been doing that for the last 10 years, but nobody wants to listen at this point in time because the political balance isn't right. Kirk, 
what can we do to to tip that in terms of uh, you know changing the United States uh, posture on on UNCLOS? You're on mute, Kirk. There we go. Um, I think Greg really started down the path. Uh, when I first got to the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon and was working with UN type issues, and we looked at UNCLOS, when it first was proposed, there were a number of issues that the United States was concerned about. And over the years, each of the issues and objections that the United States has raised have been addressed. So right now, today, every issue that the United States raised has been resolved. It is a political issue within the United States. And we've always had that high bar with the Constitution because from the start, George Washington did not like entangling alliances. Treaties went along with that. That's why that high bar was set. But I think that if you were to try and work with Congress today and the Senate to get the number of senators on board, it is unfortunate that we are living in an era where politics is beginning to drive everything, even to the detriment of our national security. If you have one party that says the sky is blue, the other one will argue it. And I think to a certain degree, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea falls into that category where nobody wants to make that first plunge. I think what we would need to do as a nation is begin to go in you always need an advocate and a sponsor to be able to talk to these senators and make sure they understand. The primary person we'd need to do is you need to get a bipartisan, two senators that could sponsor it together from both Republican and Democrat sides that could begin to push the issue and explain why it is to our national security advantage to be able to do that. Get it out of the realm of politics frame it in terms of why it's a national security issue and relate it directly to what the resources are that we could get with the Clarion Clipperton Zone through the International Seabed Authority to be helping all these nations, especially in the South Pacific. When you look right now, a perfect example that you could use is the Solomon Islands signing a defense pact treaty with China that is of great concern to first and foremost Australia, but also the United States. A lot of other nations out there are going to come under the sway and influence of China as it continues to expand its regional desires. In doing that, you could take the UN Convention on Law of the Sea and you could frame it in terms of the national security benefits that the United States would accrue by ratifying the treaty and how it would allow us to participate in an international organization that would give us far greater sway a voice and flexibility that enhances our national security and does not deter from it. And I, Greg, I would defer back to you on that one a little bit to see if you've got anything that would, would add to it, because you're, you're the true expert on it. I just experienced it from the operational perspective, uh, you know, being out there at sea. Yeah, one, one quick point to add to what Kirk has said around China. I think right now the argument for joining is even more compelling as we try to get China to subscribe to a rules-based international order. The argument that some of our senators have made against joining the law of the sea has been around that uh, we want to have access just like with fish, you know, that, oh, if so they, they would say there isn't a security impact because if the U.S. really wanted to extract minerals, there's nothing stopping them, you know. But that argument then is contrary to what we're trying to get China to do, which is to form a rules-based international order and subscribe to it. So I think now is the time to really act on that account. Greg. Sure. And maybe just one additional point to uh, include in that. Um, there, there, there are arguments that, that the United States has the uh, ability to um, pursue its interests outside of a multilateral framework. Uh, in this instance, uh, access to seabed mining sites. Um, that, whether that's an option, uh, we do have uh, the example um, you know, under US domestic law, um, NOAA licenses uh, US companies uh, to explore for polymetallic nodules uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, including the Clarion Clipperton Zone. One company, Lockheed Martin, 
uh, has um, uh, pursued uh, that domestic uh, licensing authority uh, to explore for nodules in the CCZ. Uh, it renews its uh, license every few years and it, in its renewal application, it indicates that it is not able to proceed with exploration activities unless and until the United States becomes a party to the convention. And the reason for that is they're dependent on the massive amounts of investment capital needed uh, to pursue uh, exploration activities. That investment capital is blocked because the uh, potential uh, uh, lendee uh, does not have security of uh, uh, title or tenure uh, to, to those uh, exploration sites. So it all seems to connect in a particular way. Thanks. Uh, we've got uh, a number of questions coming in now through the uh, uh, through our Twitter feed um, that are focusing on the issue of environmental protections, um, in particular in the uh, maritime uh, areas beyond national national jurisdiction. Um, but one clarification that somebody has asked for is to do with um, the moratorium itself and whether or not we're talking here about a permanent ban or actually a temporary pause. And the reason why this matters um, is because, uh, and I'm gonna quote from the, uh, the question that came in, discussing it as a permanent ban exacerbates polarization. Does the quest calculation change when we discuss a moratorium as a pause until the ISA has regulations that are robust, coherent, have financial and liability provisions on par with other extractive industries and protective of the environment. And if I can tack on something here, and I, I wonder if perhaps uh, Salim, you might be able to, to talk about this and perhaps Michelle as well. Um, regarding ISA regulations, um, to what extent have there been extensive public stakeholder engagements in the process of drawing up the regulations to this point? Um, so, Salim, let me turn it over to you, first of all, in terms of responding to the question about the moratorium. You know, is it uh, permanent or temporary and does that change things? And then perhaps uh, you know, if you could say something about stakeholder engagement and Michelle, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, uh, on the environmental take on this as well. Well, the term moratorium um, implies that it is temporary. Uh, and so it, the way the activists are framing it is as a 10 year moratorium. Uh, but the question then you have to ask is, we have other time dependent issues like climate change, like the Paris Agreement targets. So if we are going to end up delaying the uptake of certain technologies because we do not have resource minerals, then the moratorium is in conflict with environmental goals. For me, that is the most compelling argument against the moratorium because the precautionary principle has a payoff. That's why I started off by saying there's no free lunch in the universe. Ideally, we would have a, you know, as much time as we wanted to do all the high level uh, biodiversity studies, but we do not have that luxury when we have other targets, which are also environmental targets. So that's the argument currently against a moratorium. Uh, and then in terms of inclusion of uh, stakeholders, the ISA process follows all the UN processes. Like, for example, I'm right now speaking to you from the Global Environment Facilities Council meeting. I'm on the science panel for the Global Environment Facility. We have a whole civil society organization coalition present here. They have a spokesperson. They had a full day retreat just before so that they could get their views out there. They get funded to participate. So the same happens with the ISA. Uh, community engagement. Now, there are going to be certain groups who will, because they are just so disruptive that they are not going to be able to come because they are physically sometimes sending shipping vessels to intercede and act in violent civil disobedience, then, then there is going to be pushback. But otherwise, civil society is most welcome and very important. Thank you. Michelle? Well, um, the question of how the committee is actually working, or I guess more technically the commission. Um, well, I have the same question. <laughs> what what external input, What who are they talking to? What people are involved? What expertise are they accessing? Um, if, you know, 
I, I'm going to take out a take out a strong position, I guess, and say that um, one of my concerns is that, like many of the things that revolve around UN actions, um, are they really are they really reaching out and accommodating and pulling in the kind of expertise that they really need, as opposed to opinions, um, activists? I mean, you know, that's that's always the, the problem with stuff like this. Um, I don't know. Salim is probably a better, you know, person to comment on that. But having, you know, made my own trail through the ISA uh, documents and various other things and talking with people, that's that's my biggest concern is, you know, who exactly is rendering opinions um, on all of this and influencing um, how the licenses, license regulations, environmental impact assessment and stuff like that. Are, are evolving. Uh, I don't know. Yep. And, and I totally agree with the activists there that there needs to be more transparency and we need some reform of those processes. But then the engagement should be on those very constructive aspects of reform around environmental governance rather than making it a, a, a much more conspiratorial argument that somehow there's just this cabal of extractive uh enterprises who who want to plunder the earth which is the way in which it's framed you know and then it becomes very difficult to have a, even a conversation because people get very emotionally charged and so i think a constructive con 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 conversation on isa reform especially of the legal and technical commission would be very productive and i would support any activists who are willing to engage in such an, uh, an uh, effort you know, I'm also a mediator. I try to see where there are opportunities for such mediation. And just a follow-up question on that about compliance and monitoring. Um, the ISA, as I understand it, has mechanisms that it uh, has in place already to ensure compliance and monitoring of the regulations as we move forward. Is that correct, Salim, Greg? Yes, but they could be improved. Greg, you can comment. Um, <clears throat> totally agree with that sentiment. Uh, and it, at this point, uh, really the only activities underway have been exploration activities. Uh, so the monitoring and compliance uh, issues are not as big of a challenge as they will be once actual uh, exploitation uh, commences. So that uh, opens up a, a very important question, which is that in terms of exploration licenses, I know that a subset of the members of the ISA already have exploration licenses. Um, but what are we looking at in terms of a, uh, of a time frame uh, for exploration and ultimately to get to first production? Who would like to answer that question? There is this notion of what is called a trigger. Michelle, were you going to comment? Welcome to. No, I was going to say that people can go to the websites of some of the companies that are, are actually niggling around all of this. They all mentioned um, Lockheed Martin already and, and what they've been doing um, around the UK. There's the metals company, Ocean Minerals, based here in Houston, several groups. Um, the cycle times are not great. I mean, this is the world of natural resource businesses, extractive industries. Um, there are a host of issues to resolve. Um, uh, what can actually be extracted um, and 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 commercialized? I mean, you know, there there are pilot tests and and phases that everybody is going to have to go through in all of this. There are logistics to conquer, um, processing locations to be dealt with, all of that sort of thing. And everyone is in, I would say, very early stages of all of that. So, realistically, for some of them. Um, and, uh, you know, people are looking at being able to yield product uh, to customers, maybe in the 2026 or 27 timeframe. That's about the most aggressive that I've heard. Um, maybe a bit sooner for one project um, that, that is not in the, in the ISA. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, realistically, uh, just like for any of these industries, it's going to take some time to uh, move to a point where you're starting to see meaningful tonnages. I, I think yeah, another good point to raise, Duncan, <laughs> is that when you look at most of these companies that Michelle mentioned, they operate in countries that have very robust 
environmental regulations and oversight. And that in fact enhances the responsibility in how these minerals are going to be extracted, processed, and used in each of these nations. It is not just going to be the Wild West where they go out there and they're tearing up the ocean floor. It has to be done in a very demonstrative, open way, with oversight, with regulation. And I think that, in fact, enhances environmental responsibility that contributes directly to national security. I think that we may have a psychic connection, Kirk, because I was just about to ask you about the uh, uh, the role that U.S. allies might play in this equation. Um, you know, whether it's uh, Canadian, Canada, or European uh, countries that uh, are participate in the ISA and in UNCLOS. You know, is there a, a way in which those countries uh, can become uh, sources of these critical minerals for the United States? It may be a suboptimal. Uh, outcome in terms of the United States not directly participating in these licenses. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the points that we made uh, repeatedly in the Mosaic approach is the uh, importance of working with partners and allies internationally for critical minerals. Uh, we saw recently the Mineral Security Partnership being announced uh, just over a week ago. Uh, you mentioned the Quad. Of course, we've got, uh, you know, early developments with AUKUS, um, and it seems as though the United States has an opportunity here to work with key strategic allies on an issue like this. I think you're absolutely right, Duncan. What is a, a very important dynamic that is also at play here is what has kind of been referred trend, tangentially throughout this discussion, which has been the rules-based order. And when you look at trying to create a regulatory environment under which the ISA is going to operate, and they in fact adopt those regulations so that there is at least a framework to go under. What you have to remember is that in order to have a rules-based environment, what we are seeing and what we're experiencing today is when you look at the Russia and Ukraine conflict itself, it proved that if you are going to live in a rules-based order system, if that is going to be a basis upon which every nation develops their national security framework, there has to be a recognition that if you're going to have that, if there is a violation of that rules-based order, there has to be accountability by the violator, by those countries that are adhering to that rules-based system. For years, we didn't do that and in fact enabled many nations by not putting in place some of the penalties and sanctions necessary, even for minor infractions, to be able to hold them accountable. It's like anything else. If you're going to have laws out there, you follow them. And if you don't follow them, there are consequences. Internationally, we haven't done that. And that's when it's been the big challenge when it comes to rules-based order system. If we, in fact, put a regulatory environment into place that the ISA adopts and begins to use, those who do not adhere to it can be held accountable by the nations that are part of that rules-based order system. And it doesn't need to be done necessarily directly through the ISA. There are a variety of other methodologies that can be used or methods that can be used, economic, diplomatic, informational, Last thing you want to go to is the uh, the military option, but nonetheless, that's what has to happen. Because we as the United States are a democratic nation, because of the nations that we have ties, close ties with, the European, the EU, Australia, Japan, and other countries, that forms the framework for us to be able to have the rules-based system that the world needs, but we have to have the accountability for those that do not wish to follow it. Thank you, Kirk. And if I could just add one other factor to that, which is that increasingly, of course, we're seeing investors focusing on questions of environment, society, governance issues. Um, and, and that's something which, on top of the regulatory regimes within countries, um, in Europe, in North America, et cetera, um, you know, that just adds another layer of pressure. And, uh, and, and as I've said, you know, on, on a number of occasions, you know, this is going to happen. Would you rather it happens through a Chinese company which doesn't have to adhere to these because it's getting its financing from the Chinese government? Or do you want it to happen through a company that actually does have to have somebody to be accountable for? That, that ESG oversight that you just mentioned, Duncan, is also going to grow in importance as people begin to look and say, 
what I do with my investment dollars, whether it is the individual small investor or large multinational investors, in fact, prove that we have to have those things in place. And that ESG framework is going to grow in importance in the future as the economies continue to recover and get more, more robust post-COVID. Thank you, Cook. Um, I want to give everybody a chance for some closing comments, and we've just come to the, to the top of the hour. Um, but uh, Salim, I, I wanted to come back to you, and, and, and hopefully, Greg, you can, uh, you, can, you can give us an answer as well, which is, you know, how confident are we in terms of the environmental regulations that are out there right now through the ISA? Um, you know, how can we, obviously, all the regulations can be improved. In, my, in many ways. Uh, how confident do you feel at this point in time that they are enough or, or how much more work do they need? Let's begin with you, Selim. Well, I think now there's much more serious work being done because uh, there is a deadline that was put forward with reference to uh, the provisions under the ISA where uh, under law of the sea convention itself that um, a country can basically take this option of what they call the trigger, uh, where they have to come up with these final uh, regulations within the next um, 18 months or so. So Nauru, one of the countries which is a sponsoring state uh, for um, a major project, uh, they had pulled that trigger. Now that goes to the earlier question that uh, was raised about whether these countries have capacity to have um, good regulatory governance. So Nauru itself, and I've been to Nauru, it's an it's amazing place, very resilient people, but uh, only around 10, 11,000 people. And so obviously um, one has to say, well, they will need assistance. But uh, as Kirk was saying, it's not just the sponsoring state. It's going to be where the minerals are going to be processed. There are going to be regulations which will govern that. So there are a lot of safety nets along the way. And uh, we, we should be diligent. I think the activists have a very important role to make sure that those regulations are formulated well. Um, but, uh, but it shouldn't be just an obstructionist approach. Uh, so you've got also the comparison then with the environmental regulations on land. And we know that several of the major mining projects within the US have been stopped because of environmental opposition. <laughs> and that's in some cases, not just from uh, one part of the political spectrum, sometimes from both parts of the political spectrum, as we saw with the pebble mine in Alaska, which was opposed by many prominent Republicans, including Donald Trump Jr. Uh, and so, you, you know, you have this opposition to mining on land, then where are we going to get these minerals? And some of our activist friends say, well, you're going to get them from recycling. Well, you need to have metal stock to recycle, and we don't have enough metal stock for many of these minerals. So it's just the basic science and the basic engineering reality, which we have to come to terms with. Thanks, Salim. Greg, would you like to add anything to this as part of the conversation? Sure. Um, so with uh, Nauru uh, act activating uh, the two-year rule that's uh, contained in the convention framework, um, it's, um, it's easy to portray that uh, it uh, establishes a scenario where about this time next year, uh, seabed mining will commence uh, and the gates will be open, unleashing a flood of contractors. So that's really unlikely to happen. The day after the two-year period expires is likely to look a lot like the day before uh, that two-year period expires. Uh, we've remained focused on ensuring that these rules uh, provide effective protection for the marine environment. Uh, we're confident uh, in uh, being able to stay on that course uh, and uh, other uh, uh, delegations at the Seabed Authority uh, are, are likewise uh, uh, pursuing uh, uh, that course as well. Um, one other um, uh, mention of uh, the, the different um, uh, participants uh, in the civil society discussion um, and particularly because of the location of the, uh, the CCZ, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, very concerned and uh, interested in uh, the in effects on our, our local and indigenous, indigenous communities. Uh, so we, we, we want to make sure we get this right. 
Thanks, Greg. I'm going to turn to uh, uh, to the, all of the panel right now for each of the panel members for closing comments, beginning with you, Michelle. Beginning with me. <laughs> um, well, I, I think just to sum up, um, at this stage of the game in in our our human progress, um, and and looking at all of the demands, multi-generational demands going forward, I think we need to be able to figure out how to best facilitate all ideas. Um, and, and I think for all of the, of the worry and the critique that people have about our basic industries, we haven't gotten where we've gotten today if we didn't have excellence in the industries that we rely on, the products they provide, um, we always can make improvements. Those improvements tend to be at the margins in meaningful ways, usually in places, as you all have said, um, that have weak governance, um, don't have good uh, best practices, um, could benefit from our interactions, um, and so on. And so I, I, I think it behooves us to not block human beings out of any choices uh, that need to be made. We just have to figure out the best way to do them. Thanks, Michelle. Salim. Yes, so I think the question is one of environmental understanding of costs and benefits. That's where the conflict really is. And that's one of the reasons I wrote uh, Earthly Order, this new book, um, uh, because I want there to be some foundational knowledge around some of these tough choices we have to make, whether it's nuclear power or whether it's deep sea mining, all of these issues, we are dealing with suboptimal outcomes, but we have to be realistic in terms of the full system. So that's why I feel we need a systems approach and move from just environmental awareness to environmental literacy. And, and I hope that um, that can be the focus. And I'm donating all the royalties of this new book specifically for environmental literacy programs, because I really see this as a key civilizational challenge for us. Thanks, Sally. Cook. I think Duncan first, thank you for hosting this today. But when you look at the national security implications of what seabed mining offers for not only the United States, for our countries around the world, especially those that are democratic nations that do follow the rule of law, I think it is going to be very important for us to look at what resources can be gleaned by using the technology necessary to be able to process those minerals in an environmentally responsibly way, to be able to use them to enhance our economies and our society, but also to ensure that we have the ability to safeguard each of our nations by using them in ways that enhance the ability of nations to safeguard their national interests, to safeguard democracies throughout the world. Using what's available in the clarion Clipperton zone is going to be critical to the future of the United States as well as our allies. And it is going to enhance the freedom of navigation on the high seas that we want to ensure gets done first and foremost in the South China Sea, but expanding globally as well. Thank you so much, Kirk. And lastly, over to you, Greg. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, and uh, also thank you again for uh, organizing this event. This has uh, been a terrific discussion. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have participated. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, borrowing off of uh, what M Michelle suggested, um, an inclusive approach uh, uh, seems to be uh, a helpful um, uh, perspective uh, when looking at uh, seabed minerals. Um, it, it's, it's not the only option, it's an option. Uh, it seems to offer potential, uh, but there are a number of issues uh, that, that still need to be addressed. Um, today, compared to a few years ago, at least from the perspective of delegations at the Seabed Authority, uh, those concerns are being addressed in a more uh, collective way, uh, in a more uh, focused way. Uh, and um, we really um, do benefit uh, from greater awareness uh, among different stakeholders uh, and receive uh, their views, uh, which uh, are important uh, because they are helping to shape this regulatory framework. So thanks again. Thanks, Greg. 
Um, by way of closing, in addition to thanking each of our panelists and of course you, the audience, for watching, um, I'd just like to uh, make a little confessional. Um, until recently, uh, and by recently I mean within the last two years, I'd never really thought about mining that much. I'd never really thought about metals that much. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. I think a lot of people think about mining as something that used to happen in the Old West. Um, and they think that we live a modern existence where we don't depend on metals. And it reminds me of a conversation I had many, many years ago uh, with a, a Brazilian chap um, who, uh, who worked on energy policy. And he said, you know, you'll never know how important energy is until you don't have it. When you come home, you open the fridge door and the light doesn't go on. And it's very similar, I think, with, uh, with metal, metals and particularly with critical minerals, which is that they're all around us. They're in everything that we, the, that we use these days, as Michelle said uh, so eloquently uh, earlier on. And the fact is, is that we need to get them somehow. And uh, whilst, Greg, I agree with you 100% that, that uh, seabed minerals are one of the sources available to us, we're in rather a crunch situation right now, which is that we simply don't have enough supply at this point in time. So my attitude has always been, let's be open-minded, let's look at the facts, let's analyze the data and find out exactly what is the best way to move forward. Thank you so much to everybody for participating and please keep on the lookout for another Wilson event on this important topic. Many thanks.